Time to tag you. I'm going to tag you. Time to tag you. Time to tag you. Another episode of Tag Time. Hi viewers, time to tag you another episode of Tag Time. As usual, I am going to bring you very dynamic personality of our society who is serving us as a politician and he is very visionary. I have with me uh, MPP Baker, a true friend of his constituency and not only in economy but also with youth and particularly with elderly people he is working a lot. Uh, Let us talk to him further about his vision, his idea and how in this young age he was driven towards the politics which is of course a very very difficult and challenging uh, aspect of our lives right now. Uh, how would you say your journey towards uh, politics, how you ended up in politics in such a young age when people think a lot of other things, I would, I would say they say we will just r run to the skies and explore the stars. <laughs> well, it's very kind of you to say that and kind of you to ask. Um, I, uh, I grew up in a family uh, uh, where my mother and my grandparents immigrated to Canada and um, they were very uh, proud of their ancestral heritage but they were incredibly proud to be Canadian and to have the opportunity to live here in Canada. And my grandparents and my mother uh, taught me from a very young age that the reason that uh, Canada is such a great country is because prior generations have made it so. Because they've built it and left it stronger and stronger for the next generation. Um, and they also often said that what makes our community strong is that people give of themselves to help others. It could be helping your neighbor, it could be something like that, or it could be volunteering for charities or advocating for important causes. And so I was very involved from a young age with many charitable and non-for-profit causes. And over time, as that involvement got, became more serious, um, I began to realize that on all the issues that I was working on, whether it was local community issues or I was working with youth who are the victims of violence, for example, at one point, I discovered that government impacts these issues more than anybody else in many cases. And so that if I wanted to address these issues, I needed to be able to, uh, to have a voice or to be able to at least dialogue with government. And so with time I got involved in politics and that really led to an opportunity to run when my predecessor in, uh, in the riding I represent, uh, her name is Donna Cansfield, uh, decided to retire. And uh, she had represented Etobicoke Center, my riding, for, uh, for 11 years as an MPP and had been a trustee before that. And she asked me if I, uh, she, she told me she was going to retire and asked me if I would consider running. So it was very much an evolution, but one that started with a base of, um, I think, a belief that we must give back to, uh, to our communities and to our country. So politics is usually considered as the power tool. So you are saying it's not power, it's service. It's service. It absolutely is. You know, it's, um, it's interesting when you, when I, before I was elected, I often looked I, I, when I met elected officials, um, I looked at them as people with power. But when I became elected, I, I, that changed very rapidly for me. I became to, began to realize that um, you are truly here to serve. This is not about power. It's not about um, getting what you want. It's about um, positively impacting the lives of people. And in our democratic system, the, the political career of any one individual is very often fleeting. It is very rare that someone spends their entire life in politics as an MP or an MPP. So you really need to, re you have to appreciate that your legacy is not the time you spend uh, in that office or even the amount of press you get or notoriety. It's really the impact that you leave on people's lives. Yeah, I really appreciate that because I believe in that. The true leader is the one who gives the most impact in shortest time. That's right. So um, now, when you are working with different organizations, you have a huge experience of working with diverse communities. What are mm -hmm. your findings? It's interesting. I, I mean, I think the, the diversity of our country, our multiculturalism in this country and how we perceive it is, is a true strength. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an incredibly valuable tool. I think it strengthens our society. Um, I, I come from the world of business where and I, I advise many large companies. On, on business strategy and how they could grow and be successful. And one of the things that good businesses do is that they take their best employees and they insist upon the fact that those employees work in different places around the world and in different jobs. Even if it's not the job that that employee is necessarily most suited to, they still insist that they do that. 
So an employee might be do, do some work in marketing and then in sales and then in finance. So they have a breadth of knowledge and understanding of the business. And I think in, in a similar way, the fact that we have such a multicultural society where we welcome uh, people from around the world, but also nurture and support and, um, and celebrate that diversity, uh, I think we benefit from it as a society. So uh, I think it's an incredible strength for Canada. I think it's something that as government, we need to support and encourage. Um, and there are many things that government tries to do to, to support uh, those multicultural communities, to make sure that they can be part of our integrated Canadian society, but they can also celebrate their heritage and their culture and their language, um, and, uh, and that we respect each other's values and beliefs. And it's a delicate balance to strike, but it's an important one, and I think it makes us stronger. So when I'm in government, um, I think about it that way. And, um, and um, so I think that this is something that we must continue to do, and. And we can do better in this area, but I think, yeah. I think it's a very it's complicated right. issue and very sensitive because how un how understanding being developed is a huge challenge because uh, rights are easy to understand than responsibilities. That's right. But um, Ontario is considered one of the biggest province and it has a huge impact whether it's our politics or economy or anything. Mm -hmm. So why uh, why did you? think of Ontario flag. What mm. was the reason? Uh, were you so much in love with Ontario or what? It's <laughs> a good question. So, so as background and, and, for, and for, your, for your viewers who may not know, uh, in my first year in office I introduced a bill called the Ontario Flag Day Act and mm. it was a private member's bill. Private member's bills rarely pass in the legislature. That's just a function of our system of, of government. Um, but this one did pass uh, unanimously and we have um, on Ontario Flag Day uh, on, on May 21st of every year. And I introduced, it, um, I introduced it a few years ago because that was the 50th anniversary of the Ontario flag. Um, and we have a Canadian Flag Day every year that we celebrate, but we didn't have an Ontario Flag Day. But the, the real reason behind introducing the bill and celebrating the flag was not so much about the flag itself. Uh, it's not about the design of the flag or the specific emblems or symbols on the flag. But uh, for, for me, a flag, whether it be the Canadian flag or the Ontario flag, um, represents our, who we are as a people, our history, our heritage, our shared values, our accomplishments, our successes, our failures. Um, and I think that we have much to celebrate as Canadians, as Ontarians in that regard. Uh, but I think as Canadians, we sometimes don't celebrate as much as we could or even we should. And so I wanted to uh, encourage us to celebrate that history and that heritage. I've found that the Ontario Flag Day has been most, um, uh, most useful in our schools. I find that it gives teachers an opportunity to talk about the foundations of our province and uh, our history, our heritage, um, and some of our accomplishments. And if, and if that's the impact that this bill has, that more children are proud of their province, proud of this country and what it represents and can learn from that, then I have succeeded. Um, females and males, gender equality mm -hmm. is a huge talk right now, the world we are living in. Yeah. So regarding Rwandan uh, females, you have done a tremendous job. Thank you. What's your take on that? Thank you very much. So um, yes, as, as several years ago, it was in 2008, um, I had just graduated from business school with my MBA. And I decided to postpone starting my job as much as possible and I spent uh, three months in Africa and most of it in Rwanda, as you said. Uh, and I, I volunteered for uh, a small NGO who was working with women who are social entrepreneurs, women who are, have created not-for-profit uh, entities, organizations in their communities to solve issues that are important to them, to their communities. Sometimes it was one of the organizations was trying to address violence against women. One of them was trying to address the spread of HIV AIDS and try to reduce that. One of them was trying to address um, the lack of access to water in, in Rwanda, particularly in rural, rural parts of Rwanda. And so my role was to, uh, was to work with, as a business person, to help the, these groups of women, who many of whom, frankly, unfortunately, did not have uh, even a full elementary school education, to help them with some of the basics of what it would take to make sure that their organizations were sustainable. Uh, simple things like budgeting and planning were things that they had not experienced before. And so I was there to help them make that happen. Because the best social entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurial organizations are those that can be sustained and continue. Um, and I don't know if, if, if you'll allow me, I'll share a brief, brief story that I sure. think is very important to answer your question is, um, one of the things that I, you've talked about 
when you started your question about how how we how now the role of women and gender uh, and gender equality is an important issue, and I'm a big believer that. Uh, a, f a critical step towards gender equality, whether it be here in Canada or anywhere around the world, is education. Uh, and when I learned before traveling to Rwanda that only, I think at the time it was only 2% of women in Rwanda graduated from high school. Uh, a slightly higher number graduated from elementary school, but it was a very low percentage, even from elementary school. Um, then you realize that women cannot realize their potential. And, and if half the population I'm talking about women, are not accessing a basic education, then think about what that does to the potential for their families and their communities and not only their own welfare but the broader welfare of that, of that nation. At one point during my time in Rwanda, I was working with a group of women and I was helping them. They had figured out a way of bringing water to their community. Uh, they, they lived in a community that was in rural Rwanda and in, in Rwanda, um, generally women walk about two hours it can, be, it can vary, but they can walk up to three hours each way to a well to get water every day. So imagine spending four hours a day just walking to collect water. Mm -hmm. And when women were, in many cases, if a woman is ill, if her children are sick, if, uh, if she's elderly and can't make the walk, what happens? There would be men on, there, was, there, was, there were men on bicycles who as a private business would come and deliver water, but they would charge a tremendous amount of money to the women to buy the water. It was unaffordable to most of the women. And so many of the men, some of the men, would say to the women, if you can't afford to pay, you must sleep with me. Oh. So women were effectively being raped in exchange for the water because you could, not walk, you could not live without water, of course. And so this group of women formed this, had this idea. They got a donation of $1,000, $1,000 US from an NGO. They built a water reservoir in the town and they got a delivery. They bought a delivery, a truckload of water from the Rwandan utility. And then they would sell the water to the townspeople at pennies at a fraction of what the men on the bicycle would charge, something that everyone could afford. So they asked me to come and teach them how much they could charge for the water, because if they charged too little, they would not have enough money to buy the next tank load of water uh, when the water was done, was gone. So I, was work I spent a couple of hours with them very slowly working through this lesson. How do you calculate what is called in business the break-even price? And I got to the end of the lesson, and I said to the group of women, you divide this number by this number, and you will get the break-even price. You must charge at least a minimum of that price. And I said, are there any questions? And there were about a dozen women in the room. And one woman at the back raises her hand. And through a translator, she asked me, she says, what does it mean to divide? And I share that story with you because to me, that was an aha, what I call an aha moment, a, revelation, a, revolutionary, uh, a revelationary moment, because I started to appreciate the impact that the lack of education was having on not just this group but the broader society. So if people don't understand even the basics of arithmetic, then just think about all the other things that they don't understand and all the other potential that they're not realizing. Um, so of course I walked her through what division was or what I meant by division and I think they understood that uh, and I left them in a position where they could, they could proceed um, and they knew how to re repeat that, that calculation. But I think the point I'm making here is you asked about gender equality. Um, and I think that we have a great responsibility, one of the ways in which we can, do, we can ensure around the world that uh, women uh, realize their potential is, is, is through education. There are many other aspects, but that's the one that, that I, led me to I, I would enter here and uh, would say that it's the thought process and it's the globalization which is killing us simultaneously and making us more bright and brilliant mm -hmm. simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of a lot of uh, things. I I feel like for me, um, it's not a question of not understanding arithmetic, but it is the question of your exposure towards such things. Mm -hmm. So that comes with a very brighter picture, bigger picture. Mm -hmm. So intelligence has its own way of proceeding. So she was intelligent to ask the question. That That's means right. she was not exposed actually towards that thing. That's correct. Yeah. But um, again, we come back to Canada. We are in a global world where mm -hmm. we are having a lot of females like that who are yeah. not exposed to certain ideas. Yeah. So the violence which is done against them, especially domestic violence, yeah. is a huge issue because they are not ready to even acknowledge that they are being abused. And 
society generally this people who do understand are not taking proper steps. So, what is your take on that? Uh, How Ontario government is helping to overcome these problems? Absolutely. So, I think that there is man, many components to, to, to tackling that. Um, one component is uh, women, uh, we need to make sure that women know what their rights are. Uh, we need to make sure that, that, uh, that even from a young age that women understand what their rights are um, and that they know where to go for help or how to deal with a situation that's difficult. Um, what the Ontario government does is we, there's a number of elements. One thing is in our education system, one of the things that's relatively new and evolving in the curriculum is that we're talking, teaching uh, children and students um, about rights and about respecting each other. And that's not just about across cultures or across religions, it's also across genders. So that's one element. Um, but once people have experienced domestic violence, uh, there's a number of, of resources that the Government of Ontario puts in place. Um, what we've done is we've, uh, the Government of Ontario provides everything from uh, shelter uh, to women and families and children. Um, they provide counseling, uh, transition services. So what I mean by that is helping women to find housing, to find work, a whole series of programs around that. Um, so they can leave that abusive situation and, 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 and rebuild their lives. Um, and of course, housing is an, a very important component. So in, um, in Ontario, for example, uh, there are uh, two, the Ontario government funds um, shelters across Ontario uh, that together provide 2,000 shelter beds for women who've been the victims of, of, uh, of domestic abuse and violence. Um, we, and then we, of course, uh, in, in, house, in terms of housing, uh, not only is there counseling to help people find, women have find housing, but also uh, when you think about uh, uh, shelter, we in Ontario, uh, those people who have been the victims of domestic abuse are first in line to get housing because one of the most, one of the greatest challenges, of course, uh, for so many uh, women in escaping a situation like this is finding another place to, to live and, f and be safe. Um, so these are some of the things that, that we try to do. But the, again, the thing comes with the education and changing the thought process. Yes. So abuse is the ultimate end of not working on that. Sure. So what is government doing for that kind of things? Because I feel like every other uh, thing is f futile if you do not go with the very initial step which is to change the thought process, to educate through the rights and understanding of rights. What's your take on that? I couldn't agree more. And I mean, you know, we talked about this off air a little bit. Um, the, the, and that's what I was alluding to a little bit at the beginning of my answer is that um, it starts, I think, at a young age. It, at a young age, I think young people need to understand, men and women, uh, need to understand what it means to respect each other's rights. They need to know what those rights are, first of all, but then, then they need to know how to respect them, how to defend them, um, how to stand up for each other to ensure that others' rights are being respected, um, and when they're violated, to know how that they need to step in. Because your, because your, your right is my obligation, and right. my obligation is your right. I mean, it's a two-way right. traffic. That's right. And I, th and I think sometimes we, um, we rely heavily... As you, and you, when I, when I was, in, after I answered my previous question, you said to me, some of those resources are after the fact. How do we prevent this from happening? And you're absolutely right. And after, you know, we, when we think about, we often rely on our law enforcement system or our judicial system um, to, to step in. But that's, again, that's again after the fact. And I feel and like it's not the answer either. It's not the answer. Because and the thing has been done, the, you the know? Cr the crime has been committed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, it has to be before. Uh, prevention is, is the first step. Um, so, so I agree. I agree with you 100%. I think I think teaching, and if you look at the new uh, new curriculum in our in our particularly in our high schools, um, then uh, there's a very strong emphasis on on rights, on respecting each other, on understanding each other's differences. And that doesn't just mean reading about differences or different people. It means, um, uh, it, to me at least, it means that we need to make sure that young people can can step into the shoes of others, people they of different more, cultures, different more, genders, yeah. understand their perspectives so that they can then, they can, they will be there for, I think, uh, they will better understand those differences, better respect them, not see them as threats, but rather as strengths, and, uh, and be more willing and, uh, 
to, mo to defend those, those rights of those individuals who are different than they are. So to me, basically multiculturalism is the reason to understand what is your thought processes. It does not mean that you are enhancing that thought process to the society as a general to mm. be the best part. It's learning from each other and then integrating together. But I would say, if I may, I would say, it's, I would argue it would, it would be both. I, I think there, it is both. It is, it is learning, I agree, from each other. Uh, but it is also uh, it is also give, it's an exchange. It's giving back, giving back as well. I think that's what makes Ontario so fantastic. When we met at a meeting with the premier and the finance minister after after the budget was introduced, you know there were a number of questions asked by a number of members of the media, the, uh, the multi I'll call it the multicultural media, and um, and afterwards I had the opportunity to speak with a number of those representatives. And they, you are all leaders in in, in these in the, in the broader Canadian context, but in those communities, and. Um, and I've developed relationships with some of them, and it's been interesting to learn from them. So I benefit from that, but uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's an exchange. I think. Yeah, it's that's what I said actually. Yeah. So now come back, uh, come to you. You are so young, so enthusiastic, mm -hmm. so um, keen to learn, and so giving to your writing. What are your hopes and your goals and your understanding, and what you think you can contribute towards it? That's a very, very good question and a, and a, and a big question. Um, I think that um, I represent a riding, it's called the Tobacco Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those of uh, your viewers who are from the Toronto area, the GTA, um, it is uh, bordered by Dixon Road in the, nor in the north, Dundas Street in the south, and it runs east to west from, uh, east from the Humber River, uh, west to the Mississauga border. And uh, from my vantage point, I think there are a number of local issues. I represent a lot of seniors. Uh, a large, a much, one of the, we have one of the largest percentages of seniors of any riding in the country in my Anatobico Center. And so I spend a lot of time on seniors issues. And you know, that means strengthening our health care system. That means, um, and, and there's a lot under there, uh, whether it be hospital care or community care or reducing wait times or making sure you can access a specialist when you need one, or that we support families. I'm not even talking about the seniors, but when I knocked on doors when I was first campaigning, one of the things I learned was that there are a lot of families uh, that are part of what we call that sandwich generation who are raising children but also caring for their aging parents who are struggling. And the healthcare system uh, isn't keeping up with their needs. Um, so uh, there's a number of things that I've tried to do there, uh, whether it be strengthening local hospitals, making sure that as a government we invest more in community care. Because uh, for seniors in particular and for those families I spoke about, that is very important that they, they can get a nurse, they can get a PSW when they need one to support them. Um, and you, we talked earlier, to tie this back to the earlier question about women and equality, very often um, women are the primary caregivers in families still. And uh, if we want to make sure those women who want to be able to work, uh, live active lives outside the family, then we need to be able to provide the supports for them to be able to do that. That means that if they're caring for their aging parents, we have good care for their parents. It would be community care or hospital care, whatever the case may be. It means child care as well. So these are all complementary services that help support, not just they support men and women, but, but women benefit uh, importantly. Um, so that's one thing. I'm, um, I'm working very hard in, in uh, I'm a business person by background, so I've spent a lot of time trying to, I work with Minister Charles Souza on the budget. I'm his parliamentary assistant. And, uh, and so working to make sure that we, government spends tax dollars wisely. Um, I know uh, it's... Uh, it's a, a huge issue right it's now. It's a huge issue, of course. And, yes. uh, and it has always been, I think. Yes, it's, it's a huge issue. And, we, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenge at every level of government. Uh, you know, when you work in business, you have one bottom line. You want to maximize profit. When you're in government, you have many, multiple bottom lines, multiple priorities to address. And so it's more challenging, but also I think governments need to do a better job of instituting some of the principles, some of the approaches that well-run businesses do in managing their money. And so I've tried to bring that to government, and I've worked very closely with Charles Souza, not just on balancing the budget, but on making sure we get value for money and we invest where we can make a difference. Education's a big one for me. I think that, we talked earlier about education at the elementary and high school level, but I have, um, I am optimistic, very optimistic about our future, but I also have a concern. And my concern is, is that we have a lot of talented young people who work hard, who study hard, who go to college, they go to university, whatever they pursue, and then they struggle to establish themselves to get on their feet. Uh, and this is happening more and more. And yet, at the same time as that's happening, there are businesses out there looking for workers, looking for people. And in a global 
economy and a global labor market. It's, I'm not, when people are looking for jobs, they're not just competing with others in Ontario, they're competing with smart, young, talented, educated young because people. Because we are international, we, we are having uh, students all around, uh, from all over the world. That's right. So our competition is harder than anybody else. Well said. And so how do we make sure that our young people who, who live here can achieve their potential? And I think one of the things that I've worked a tremendous amount on is trying to make sure that our post-secondary education system, and in addition to our secondary and elementary, but that our post-secondary education system, whether it be colleges or universities, are preparing young people for the jobs of tomorrow. When, uh, and that doesn't mean that's all, that's, that's not the only role of a university. Students go to university to learn, to explore, to meet, there's a lot of, re and I respect that. But uh, it's very important, I think, that we make sure that the post-secondary system is adapting uh, to the new world of employment and opportunity so the young people can, can compete. I introduced a, a private member's bill. Uh, this is a couple of years ago now. Uh, and I'm working with Minister Matthews to see if we can do something uh, to move that forward. Um, one of the challenges that a lot of young people face is they, when they're choosing a university or choosing a college program, you know, it's very difficult to navigate all the options that are before you when you graduate from high school. Which university do I study at? Or do I study at college? What program do I take? What jobs will I get? Uh, what experiences will I have? Uh, that's a very big, uh, actually, huge uh, uh, reason of depression and a huge reason of not uh, getting the potential which we Canadians can is because our youth is not clear what they want. And on the top of it, as you said, that we are preparing for certain niche market without understanding the process they are coming through. I mean, it's very, it's getting more and more difficult. And I always say is that why do not Canadians consider their youth first? Because our best investment around the globe is investing on our youth. So what will we do on their thought process? Because education is being professional. So professionalism is very much needed, but professionalism has its own requirements. What's your take on that? Oh, absolutely. I agree with that 100%. I mean, I think that that's the... Uh, we need to make sure, in my view, that uh, you know, if we think about the, 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 the globe, the world that we live in today, um, our young people need to be the best. Not just so that they can find a job, but it, it, it even goes beyond that. Um, we have to carry the whole legacy we have. We have to retain our country where we live that's in. That's right. And, and it, let's be honest, when companies, and I advise companies, so I know how this works, when large, any, it can be large or small businesses, when, when people look to invest money to create jobs, to hire people, they don't, the first thing that they look at is not where's the lowest cost. Yes, that's, cost is important. They don't even look. The number one thing that they care about is the talent of the people. They seek out the best people. Be and that is the only way any jurisdiction, Ontario, Quebec, New York, Canada, uh, can compete sustainably with other jurisdictions around the world. That is really at the essence of our collective prosperity. So, and that begins with making sure that our education system, and, and in particular our post-secondary education system, positions young people to be learning about learning, uh, positioning them to be able to compete in the jobs of tomorrow, in the, uh, and, and, uh, and if we can do that, then uh, not only will those young people be employed, but we will attract more and more employment and the best people. Here Everybody has something special about them and that speciality can be exploited okay. through uh, tremendous uh, reason of education and professionalism, which is called training otherwise, to train them that way. Yeah. Thank you very much, Endless Talk. Any m message you want to give to our viewers through uh, our TV, Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. And I simply just want to say that it's been an honor to be here. And I first of all want to thank you for having me. Um, I also want to say that, um, that for those of you who are, in, who are interested in the issues that I've talked about, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And those of you who live in Etobicoke Center, please don't hesitate to reach out. I am always here to help. Um, I think that we, I have the opportunity and the privilege um, to, to not just serve uh, the people of Etobicoke Center, but but to work on some issues that are very important to our collective futures. And if I can do a better job through your input or your support, I would welcome that. So thank you again for thank having you. me. Thank you very much. Viewers, we are living in such a great country, which is the reason for uh, making us so uh, diverse and so strong. The only thing which we need to learn is that we try to understand 
the world we are living in. Right now it is challenging, but politicians are those people who as a leader contribute and give you the way to understand those kind of realities where we are living in. Our youth is very important. Today our guest was one of the young people who can understand the right now reality and can also contribute towards future. Future is for those who make their home for living tomorrow also. It is responsibility and a right simultaneously. We need to understand and in living in Canada and this global world to understand rights and responsibility together is very important. With these words, thank you very much for watching my show. Number 1 Multicultural Channel This is Tag TV